uh, the webinar. So yeah, you you may prepare uh, your presentation and of that. So do you do you need uh uh like to present a videos for today? Yeah, I will be sharing some. Actually, can I just practice sharing yeah. my screen yeah. now? Sure, sure. Simone, is that all right? Okay. Yeah. It says it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So raise up. I think you need to enable mm -hmm. that. Okay. So wait. wait. <clears throat> okay. I think you can you can share right now. Okay. So let me see. I've I've tried to close as many screens as possible. Yeah. So I don't confuse myself. Okay. Is that one? <laughs> Okay, let's try that. <clears throat> so can you see um, AAAS science yeah. assessment? Yeah. Okay, how about, can you see um, energy forms and change? Yep. Oh, good. The transformation? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Can you uh, uh, play it maybe? Okay, I'll play, yeah. I'll try this one. Mm. This one. Okay. Let's see if you can hear. Yep. Well, actually, that's not a very exciting one to hear. <laughs> I'll try another one. Ah, uh, this one. Yeah. Okay. Can that you was hear? an awful lot of information. Okay. How about sounds good. Hands is yep. You can hear? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's fantastic. Okay, I'm gonna stop um, the screen sharing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that test. Welcome. Okay, I'll do the yeah. same. Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah. Someone you you're going first. Uh, is that right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. And I'll just see the video. Okay, you can hear yeah. the sound clearly. Yeah. I can yeah. hear too. Great. Okay, all good. We got a systems check. All good. All good. Okay, so now we will prepare for yeah, a little bit, so waiting for the participant and about three minutes. I think we can we can go.
Okay, so let us start now. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, everyone, all participants. Uh, our resource person, uh, Dr. Connie Sirkani and Simone Blue, and uh, all the participants of today's uh, webinar. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, welcome to our 15th SIKIS uh, webinar uh, series. So my name is Reza Steawan, and I will be the uh, moderator for today's uh, webinar. So this part of our uh, SIKIS webinar series is a collaboration activities with Australian uh, Academy of Technology and Engineering, which is aimed at providing insight of the implementation of STEM and also science learning uh, uh, activities in the uh, uh, and era. So, uh, to start our webinar, so let's move to our first agenda, which is the presentation of the Simeo color and Simeo song. Yeah. Yeah. 
you very much. So now let's proceed to our main session of this webinar. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, all the participants, dealing with science education or science uh, learning, I believe that we are agree that uh, science learning is not just about uh, memorizing uh, scientific facts or uh, scientific concepts only, but uh, rather it's, it is actually uh, that how we can facilitate scientific learning, uh, scientific literacy, using appropriate strategy to deliver uh, active engagement of uh, learn learners in the learning process. So especially in this uh, pandemic situation, that we need additional strategy to make sure that this kind of science learning uh, is available to the learner and in a remote or a distance mode. So that, that is what we are going to discuss further in this webinar, and I'm uh, very happy to inform you that we have invited related experts from uh, Australia. The first is Ms. Uh, Simone Blom. She's from uh, Southern Cross University, the Faculty of Science Education. So how are you, uh, Ms. Simone? Hi, Risa. Thank you very much for having me. And hello, everyone that's joining us uh, this afternoon as well. Lovely to be here with you all. Yeah. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Ms. Moan. And our second uh, speaker is Dr. Connie Sifoni from uh, Monash University, Faculty of uh, Education. So how are you, uh, uh, Dr. Connie? Oh, I'm very good. Reza, thank you very much for having me today. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So, um, so they are here to share their expertise and also insight on today's webinar topic. So the topic, the title of our webinar today is inquiry-based approaches for remote teaching and learning in STEM featuring the water in 21st century module. So without no hurry to, so let's move to the presentation session of our webinar speakers. But before we start, please allow me to deliver some uh, important information. Okay, so uh, each speaker will, uh, there will be 30 minutes for presentation and after all speakers present, uh, presentations, we will have about 30 minutes for Q&A and discussion. And for the participant to ask questions during the discussion. Uh, for those who join this webinar on Zoom, you can type your question on the Q&A box on the Zoom application. We will invite uh, one or two selected uh, participants to directly ask question to the speaker. And while other selected question will be read by uh, moderator. And for the participant joining uh, from YouTube, please type your question on YouTube uh, comment box, and I will read selected question from the participants. And also, please uh, be informed that we will provide electronic certificate for all the participants of this webinar. So to get the e-certificate, all participants must fill the attendance form and evaluation form. And the links of the force will be shared at the end of uh, the webinar. So please stay tuned uh, until the uh, end of our webinar today. So, OK, uh, everyone, uh, we are moved proceed to our main uh, agenda today that our first speaker is Ms. Simone Blom. So before, before that, please allow me to read her uh, short biography. So uh, Ms. Simone Blom is from Southern Cross University, Faculty of uh, Science Education. So it's her academic specialization is a science and primary uh, secondary teaching. Uh, and an honors degree in education. And some of her recognitions uh, that uh, she's a teacher and environmental education consultant in numerous states and territories in Australia. And she's also experienced as a head of science uh, school, sustainability officer, and PCAA assessor. 
She also helped the development of water for the 21st century curriculum package for the Stellar project. Okay, that uh, is uh, just a short biography of uh, uh, Ms. Sam uh, Blow, maybe later. Uh, you may also uh, uh, tell uh, some additional information about, uh, about you and your uh, experience in the field of uh, science learning and science education. So uh, let's start our sports. First speaker's presentation, Ms. Simone Blow, the time is yours. Thank you very much, Risa, and, and thanks again, everyone, for being here. It's lovely to be sharing with you. I wish I could be there with you in person uh, in beautiful Bandung, as we have been the last few years, but yeah. equally, equally, it's wonderful to be able to share in this space as well. It's better than no nothing at all. So what I will do now is share my screen. If you do have any questions about my my background in, in science education, um, please feel free to ask that in the, in the Q&A or about my presentation as well. So I'm here today to be talking about the ATSI Stellar STEM module water in the 21st century. And what is wonderful about this module is that you can download all the resources for free from the Stellar website. So I know I might lose you a little bit if you jump across there, but we do have access to all the materials and they have been translated into Indonesian as well, which is wonderful. So you've got these thick booklets that you can download. So Water in the 21st Century is a, um, is a curriculum module and it engages with sustainability and social issues. So if you were here last week, Peter and Dr. Greg discussed the importance of context-specific STEM learning. So Water in the 21st Century utilises really urgent and real-world issues to engage students in STEM skills and knowledge using an inquiry-based pedagogy or, or approach to that learning. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about why we adopted an inquiry-based approach. So inquiry-based approaches um, in, uh, are demonstrated through research to improve conceptual understanding. They require students to be active participants in their learning and not passive observers waiting to be filled with knowledge. So moving into that social constructivist approach to learning um, rather than the old uh, mug and jug approach. You know, students are very hands-on, they're very engaged in what they're doing and they know what they're doing. And the model that we use um, is using the science inquiry skills. And these are outlined um, in the Australian curriculum. These are specific skills that students must engage with in their learning. And um, you can see there, science is presented as a cycle. So even though students will undergo an investigation and do some hands-on learning, and it might end with a communication and some form of representation, they might submit a project or do a presentation. What should happen from that is that there are more questions formed. We would hope that each science um, investigation or experiment leaves students excited and wanting to know more. And that's where the cycle continues and how we expand our scientific understanding. We keep asking why. Why does that happen? What is, what is going on? We want to know more. So as, as I stated, um, water is a really meaningful and relevant concept. It's a con complex issue, um, but it provides very meaningful learning for our students in STEM. So this is in Australia a few years ago in my town. I live in a small regional town in New South Wales. There are about 25,000 people in the regional area. There's lots of um, farming community and we, um, we experienced some severe flooding. And this was off the back of a drought. So in Australia, water issues are very complex because we go from extremes of having a huge amount of water to having no water at all. So it can be a bit tricky for students to understand and navigate how we can be in a water crisis globally when we do have these extremes. 
There's also been a lot of talk about coal seam gas mining in Australia and in the United States of America. And the impacts on our water supply um, have been a real fear for people. People are worried about their water supply and, and the, um, the aquifers underground and what's going to happen to the quality of our water through coal seam gas mining. So this adds to the complexity of human impacts um, on our availability to access fresh and clean drinking water. And I know when I was in Indonesia last year, um, there, were, there were fire bushfires happening in Indonesia. So that's a, an article from September 2019. And in Australia, we had the same thing. So, you know, these, these very severe um, climate changes that we're experiencing and climate events have really changed the way that we perceive, uh, perceive water in our environment. It's um, a lot less predictable and in the future they are project predicting that we are going to have drier climates and access to less fresh water. Um, it's also found that Indonesia has its own water and sanitation crisis as the fourth most populated country in the world with Southeast Asia's largest economy, uh, economy and 258 million inhabitants, 27 million people lack access to safe water um, and 51 million people lack access to improved sanitation. So we can see for Indonesia that the the complex issue of water is paramount and it's important that students are given the opportunity to engage with this. So this is why we developed the Water in the 21st Century module as part of the ATSI Stellar STEM collection. And I'm gonna talk through one of the examples today, um, which is the unit on water farming. There are four units, however, um, uh, and each unit is, gone through in detail in both the teacher and the student booklet. And there are 12 inquiry based investigations in those booklets as well. In the teacher booklet, we tell you how to use it. So we go through how you can use each, um, each unit and the module. Uh, there's approximately three hours per unit. We've got the risk and safety considerations. We've got curriculum outcomes, summary guides, Everything you need is in there. We've even got sample student responses. Um, at the front of the student booklet, there is an investigation planner. And this is really important in showing students. I'll just hold that up there. That's just at the very start on page three. Show students how to actually undertake the investigation process. So they get to learn how to actually carry out an investigation or an experiment themselves, which is really important in providing students agency and providing them with an understanding about how they learn and how they can find things out. If they don't have a system or a process that they can adopt, students may not be able to see that they can actually find things out and discover new things and discover new knowledge and new science. Um, we, I'll talk about that in just a minute, actually. So this is again that, that student investigation planner. So we do this using the five E's approach, and this is just one approach to science and STEM education. And that's the approach that we've adopted through this module. Engage is about not just getting students um, hooked in or interested in, in the topic, but it also activates their prior knowledge through question, questioning, contextualising and identifying a problem. We call it inquiry-based learning, but often it's infused interchangeably with problem-based learning because students are presented with a problem or a challenge that they have to um, find a solution for. In the explore, they conduct an investigation and, and that might be something quite basic to test some skills and do some exploration, or it might be a bit more complex. In the explain phase, it's not about the teacher explaining, but about the teacher facilitating student representation and clarification of their conceptual ideas. 
Now you'll notice there's only three E's there. You can do a three E cycle, um, but the research really advocates for doing five E's where you've got an elaborate and evaluate phase. So an elaborate where you conduct another investigation and the water in the 21st century model module has three investigations per topic. So you've got opportunity to really engage in some deeper learning. Um, and the evaluate is where you re-represent and reflect on the learning process. So for example, if we were gonna to go to unit four, you could go to page 35 of the student booklet and look at those questions. Those questions are designed to engage the student into their process of learning. And you may need to adapt them based on your context, but that's okay, you've got the framework there. Another thing that you could do is write down or draw what you think is the best way to clean dirty water. And what's really important here is that it is what you think, it's not a research task. So particularly when you're doing remote online learning, it's important that students um, are given the opportunity to represent their, their learning or their thinking immediately because um, it's much more tempting and it's much, more, uh, it's much easier for them to get onto Google or do some research to answer the questions that you want them to find, the, get the answers to. And a way that I've approached that this year, as, as we've been forced into doing a lot of remote online learning, is through um, using the annotate tool in Zoom or your platform. I've also been using Blackboard, uh, which, is a, um, which is an online learning um, platform. And um, the annotation tool is great because you get to see who is engaging, who is writing on the whiteboard and, and find out who isn't. But equally, um, the chat box can be a great tool to use as well to get students to immediately write down what their thinking is. And that immediacy um, gives you access to their prior learning. It enables you to plan your future lessons uh, it determines the level of engagement and also the level of understanding of that concept. So if we are going to look at this scientific in, um, challenge 12 as an example, we want to think about it um, as setting it up as a fair test, which might be in your elaborate phase or the fourth phase of that um, pedagogical model, the five E's, or is it an exploratory investigation? Are they just doing it to get some skills? And when we're doing the planning, if we decide to do a fair test investigation, for example, we have, to, we have to clarify and define the variables. And then we have to come up with our question for investigation, which is like our problem. A tool that I really like to use is the variables grid. And I ask students, okay, what things affect the water quality when designing and engineering a water filtration device? So what I would do at this point and um, what I will do is get out my annotate tool and I could ask, I don't know if this is okay, Riza, if um, people can put in the chat um, uh, and hello from the Philippines there, Mikhail, um, if anyone would like to put in the chat what things they think would affect the water quality when designing and engineering a water filtration device. I don't think you've got access to the annotate tool, but you might be able to put something in the chat. Okay, so please, uh, there's not much participants, so you may uh, type there in the chat box. I think we've got one in the Q&A box. So yep. I've got a hello from that. Hello. Uh, I'll see. The filtration substance. Okay, great. I'll just close this box down. So what you can do, yeah, as I was saying, with your um, annotate tool in Zoom, which I assume most people use Zoom. Um, filtration substance. So in a normal um, webinar, you'd be able to, or your participants or your students, would be able to use the annotate tool, but because we've got the special webinar function, we can't do that, but that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so the number of filter components. Yep. Any other ones? 
um, water more clean. Yeah, okay, so um, that I might say that one, Nuri Martini, is the water quality. So I've already defined that variable, but absolutely, yep. So the mineral composition. Or, yep, or the source. I'll put it down exactly as you've said it. Yeah. Um, yeah, microorganisms. Yep, so we've got, um, got some other ones here. Great. They're going into the chat pretty fast, so I'll just grab the ones that I can. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yep, fantastic. And I know we'll have people looking from all over um, different. Okay, yep, got the dissolved minerals there. Yep. Yeah, the time, time. great. Yeah. Yep, beautiful. I'll just leave it there. Thank you all for your contribution. Yeah. That was fantastic. Much appreciated. Yeah, um, thank you very much. So we've got a few, we've got we filled up our grid there now. So you can see that that can happen quite quickly and it's a great way for students to engage in this process. Yeah. What we need to then do is decide, okay, well, what is the variable we want to change if we want to make this a, a true fair test investigation? So what I might choose to change is the filtration substance. So I'll get my pen out there and I'll say, I'm going to change this one. Okay, so that then becomes um, my independent variable. Okay, I'm going to put an I there for independent. Okay, that's the one I'm going to change. Whereas the number of, um, with everything else, I'm going to keep them the same so they're the controlled variables. So I'd say that's controlled. All of these variables are controlled. So I want to keep them the same. And this one in the middle, the one I measure, is also called the dependent variable. So I'll put a D there for dependent. Okay, so that's a really fun activity. You could get your students to be doing that as well. And I'm just going to clear that off and move on to the next one. Okay. So then what I can do is transfer that information directly into this question generator. So what happens to, now remember my dependent variable, do you remember what that was? What was the dependent variable? What was the thing we're going to measure? Does anyone remember? Yep, great, thank you. What a quality. I think. Check if that's common. There we go. Water quality, fantastic. When we change, and we were going to change the filter. I think we're going to change the filter components or the or the filter material. But that's okay. I'll put component. Okay, so we can see there now. We've got a very clear question for investigation that gives our investigation focus students can start to develop a, uh, an understanding of the relationship that exists between dependent and independent variables, um, which enables them greater clarity when it comes to actually answering their question. They can look at patterns and they can look at what's actually happening. So I'll just clear that one again. And we'll continue. Okay, so we've we know what the, what the variables are. We know what our question is. What equipment do we need? One thing I love about this module is that it's all stuff you have at home. Okay, it's um, it's getting it's getting a water bottle and cutting it in half and using one half as your water filter, um, or sorry, your funnel, and and one half is your beaker where you collect your water sample after you've created your filter. Um, you might get just some, um, you might get a serviette and use a serviette to create your water filter. Uh, you might have some, 
You might have some stones or some rocks in your garden that you can put in your water filled filtration or your, your um, funnel. Um, you might have some kitchen cloth that you can use. There's so many different things you can use to make a filter. So students can be doing this at home and have their video and actually show you what they're doing and how they're setting it up. Um, they can make their own dirty water. So you know, just, getting, just getting a jug and some dirt and mix it up and you've got some dirty water as your sample. Now, one of the things that students might not have yeah, you could use some cotton, absolutely. You might have some charcoal from the garden. There's lots of options and, and lots of things that you can use, absolutely. Um, one of the things you might not have is this turbidity tube. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute. So this is, um, this is us doing it in, in uh, Indonesia and also in Australia over the last few years. Uh, so you can see it's super simple but very engaging. It's a surprisingly engaging thing to be doing is creating a water filter and, and seeing how um, the results differ depending on uh, the different uh, substance you use as the filter. And you can see some people have chosen to use a combination of different materials uh, and some people have just chosen to use one material and compare them against each other. Okay, so we've got our equipment sorted and how will we measure the results? And that's what we need the turbidity tube for. Now I've got a turbidity tube here. So you can see it's got these, um, it's got the marks along the side. So, so you can measure, you might be able to see the numbers, but you can measure um, how clean your water is by, if you look down into the tube. So if you look down like that, You'll see at the bottom, and I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it, but I'll try. You'll be able to see there's some marks on the bottom. So those marks will disappear if the water is very dirty. And you can see there that one's got a slightly different, um, this one's got a slightly different mark on the bottom here. But what's really cool about this is if your students don't have that, it's okay. You can make one. You can draw some lines on a bit of paper and come up with your own measurement system. And you can put some lines on the side here and measure it out for each centimetre. So it's, it's an alternative way for students if they don't have the materials, um, the, the materials they need or the equipment they need at home, they can get a bit creative and um, come up with different ways of doing it. Um, I'll keep going. And another important part of um, recording the results is, um, of, of planning the investigation, sorry, it's recording the results. So data tables are a really important part of learning in science. So um, what can be good practice is to actually model what you want the students to do. So talk about, you know, independent variable, go on the left-hand side of the table, and then you have your dependent variable on the right-hand side. So students start to make the link between the independent and the dependent variable in how they organise their information. And this translates really um, clearly into a graph then as well. Now, I know Connie's gonna talk about this very shortly about representing your findings, but this is um, often the most challenging things for students to do is to actually bring all that data together and everything they've learned and put it into a, um, a clear, concise uh, summary and, and discussion of their findings and come to some clear conclusions. Um, so evidence-based explanations uh, something that is really important in science and STEM education as well. But I'll leave Connie to talk about that. I'm going to quickly talk through one more little example for you. So um, another example that we could do is another so socio-scientific issue is oil spills. Um, now, in I'm a university lecturer in science and technology education at Southern Cross University, and um, this year is one of our tasks. We asked our pre-service teachers to develop a way to engage their students 
in socio-scientific issues in STEM. And this is one example of their product. And they came up with a fake news report using a program called Powtoon. And Connie will talk about this shortly. Okay, so remember, this is just fake news report. We come to you live with a breaking news report. An oil tanker has exploded in the Pacific Ocean between Australia and China after running into a coral reef. Rescue missions from a nearby island have recovered all persons aboard the ship safely. The cleanup crews have failed in their attempts to localise the oil slick. Scientists are calling this an ecological disaster and say the effects of spreading oil will have catastrophic effects on surrounding islands, wildlife and plant life. Local marine experts have confirmed the presence of endangered species in the area and are calling on help from Australia and China in their battle to contain and remove the oil in time to save the local area. So far, at least 1,000 tonnes of oil is said to have leaked from the ship and the Australian government has declared an environmental emergency. It announced this morning it will be enlisting the help of a classified Year 3 class to engineer a prototype for the massive cleanup job ahead. The prototype will be sent to our environmental allies in China to build and provide advanced technological support during its maiden voyage. We wish this class all the best in their speedy design process. The planet is relying on you. So you can see that's a really creative way to engage students in a socio-scientific <sighs> issue. Um, and so what the objective of this activity is, is to consider opportunities for including sustainability in the STEM curriculum. Um, obviously, students get to engage in all of those STEM subjects when they get to do these hands-on activities. So for this, the materials, again, are fantastic in that they're things that you could use um, from at home. It's designed to be done um, by your students. So um, it's very, you know, very simple things. Uh, having a, um, just grab it, one more one there. So you might just get a tray like this. It's just a plastic tray. You might put some um, fake animals and, and plastic things in there. Um, you know, I might be using some just fake animals in there, some plastic things, um, and then just putting in some, some water. And then you can actually mix your water with cocoa or coffee. I mean, sorry, mix some oil with cocoa or coffee. So you just get some just normal vegetable oil, mix it with cocoa or coffee, and it makes it black or brown. Um, and then when you pour it into your, your container, you can actually see it's like an oil slick. And then you can ask your students, again, you might just use, what happens if you try to clean it with chucks or, or paper towel? Like, see if they can get create something um, really creative and inventive to be able to clean up that oil spill. And you can also get them to see what happens if, you know, you put the oil on a feather, what happens to that? How can you clean that? What happens if you use detergent? We think of detergent as cleaning up oil, but then how do we clean up the detergent? There's lots of issues that can be explored here with these hands-on learning opportunities. Um, so there's some instructions of how they could go about it. It's great if you can get them to actually do some drawing um, and do a bit more proper design work as part of that STEM framework. Uh, and it, you know, if they can get the more complex, the better. And, and as students progress and get older through school, depending on what year level you're working with, you can change the complexity of your expectation in terms of the assessment task. So we did this with our pre-service teachers. Um, and, you know, a lot of them had different ways of doing it. So you can see how some of them have set it up here. Um, all quite different, but the same, the same idea. And they, all things they could do just from home. Um, we did like a reflection and, and this is using that annotate tool about how they did their learning. So an important part of STEM is obviously 
um, looking at the science, technology, engineering and maths concepts. So with the science of water, we're looking at the chemical, biological and physical aspects. In technology, we're looking at the digital and design aspects as well as engineering and maths. And it's important you map these out. So in the Australian curriculum, we've mapped it out for year seven and eight as part of the module. And you'll see there, we've got um, the different sciences, we've got the science inquiry skills, and also the, the science values. And you'd also want to map it out, obviously, against your technology and your maths, but you might also choose England, English and, and um, the HASS subjects, so the, the social sciences as well. Now, we don't have engineering as part of our curriculum. That's embedded in technology and in mathematics. Um, but that's also what, what, you know, should be done in terms of mapping out your, um, your STEM curriculums. And what can be good here is just to look at the activity you're doing and go, okay, what are the science, technology, engineering and maths concepts and where do I locate those in the curriculum outcomes? Okay, so what is our role as teachers? We're designed to be facilitators. We've got to rethink our role in the classroom. Um, we want to facilitate discussion. We want to pose questions. We want to extend student ideas and we really want them to explore and investigate for themselves. We've got to rethink how we, how we do science and that's what um, STEM is about. It's about really reinvigorating the, the science curriculum. So there's a lot of research coming out around that, that students need an awareness of how they learn um, rather than just being told everything all the time and then not knowing how to do anything for themselves. Um, as a teacher and, and, you know, while you're doing your online learning, there are some really cool tools that you can, you can own. Um, as, uh, as a facilitator, you know, you might show some of the products that are, have been invented so far for students to be able to really think about um, some of the more challenging designs. So this one here, oh, I'll get this one up, is a, is a water filtration device and you can see um, what, what it tells you that it, it removes there and also um, what's, uh, what it uses, what the filters are. So that's one of those and you could, you know, uh, show students how some of these commercial filters work as well. And that other one that I was showing you before is the Catadine water filter. And that could be one that you use um, with your students uh, just as a demo, as a demonstration. Um, if you would like to find out more, obviously through the Stella um, website, there's lots of information on that. And I am going to leave it there. Sarah Makassi, I'm Simone Blom. Um, got my contact there. I'm at Southern Cross University the School of Faculty of Education. And there are some references from the presentation if you'd like to read and learn some more. And thank you very much, Sarah Makassi. Okay, terima kasih, Simone. Thank you very much. Uh, really interesting uh, presentation for you. Uh, so, uh, well, from from your, from your presentation, that uh, we learn about uh, some insights about the water in the 21st century as a module in the Stellar that we can use um, water as a context in the STEM learning, and also you uh, shown a sample of. Uh, uh, STEM learning using this uh, context, water as the context for STEM learning, and also you uh, show us also how do you use technology such, such as this uh, Zoom technology to have quality distance remote uh, learning. So yeah, we'll talk uh, more about that in the uh, discussion session. So now Let's us proceed to the second speaker, uh, Dr. Kony uh, Sirakoni. So before that, let me uh, introduce uh, uh, a bit about uh, Dr. Kony Sirakoni. So uh, 
uh, Dr. Connie is uh, her specialization is a, a research fellow in Monash University Faculty of Education, and some of her recognition uh, first is Monash Q project investigating how educators use evidence in their practice. And then she has offered 20 years of experience in education, science, and environmental education, and also the education policy. And she's also a university, university lecturer of pre and interface uh, teacher in Australia and uh, uh, Canada. And also she's the curriculum design and professional development design of science, STEM, and environmental education workshop and resources. Her research focus is uh, the evidence used in education, uh, also science education, and she's also the lead author of uh, many star curriculum packages. So that is just a bit of uh, uh, background. So now, uh, without any further ado, uh, please, Dr. Uh, Kani, the time is yours. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you, Simone, for your presentation. Um, and hello, everyone. I'm I'm actually um, speaking here from Melbourne, Australia, and I see on the chat box we have people from the Philippines, Cambodia, Laos, Indonesia. Please type in other places you're from. It's it's really amazing we're connected. And as Simone said, we we miss being there in person. But um, somehow through Zoom and through um, the internet, we get connected in very interesting ways as well. Um, so some opportunities have come of that. Um, in the past with, uh, I guess the past five years or so, I've had a chance to work with the very fine people at, uh, at Stellar, including Mr. Greg and Mr. Peter Pentland. And of course I've met Reza in person and the wonderful team there at KITEP. Um, and I often talk about pedagogy and assessment in science education. So I'll be building on some of the ideas that um, my colleagues have been put forward and going through some examples of what inquiry can look like online. Um, and I'm gonna be going um, on a few different websites and uh, I will share all of these links with you after, after the presentation. So I've, I've prepared a package uh, and, and shared that with Reza. So don't worry, you will get all of those links. Um, so for now, you just have to uh, enjoy and, and, and follow me as I go. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so I hope you can see my lead slide. Okay, good. All right. So today, as promised, I'm going to talk about how we can support all of the wonderful stellar activities you've been learning about by focusing on concepts, representations, inquiry, and doing this online. Okay, we'll start with concepts. So there's many resources on concepts, and today I'm going to focus on two key resources. And here I'm going to share, sorry, another screen. So bear with me as I going to skip across screens and hopefully the technology will cooperate. So right now, I hope you can see the AAAS science assessment. Reza, do I have a thumbs up for that? Okay, good. All right. So this, this website is very easy to find. It's from the um, American Academy of Science and it outlines, uh, you can see a number of concepts across life, physical, earth and nature of science. Um, and this is a really valuable site for um, identifying the key concepts in each of these uh, topic areas and also what's called misconceptions or alternative um, conceptions. So I'm just gonna click on, for example, we're studying physical science. Let's look at uh, states of matter. Say we're studying states of matter and you wanna find out, well, what are the key concepts associated with states of matter? Here you see a list of possible concepts. So let's um, click on all matters made of atoms. All right, there's, there's a list of sub ideas here. Sorry, I'm sk skipping back a little bit. So these 
our um, main concepts, is, uh, or I guess higher level on a concept um, related to matter, but you as a teacher, depending on the topic that you are teaching and the level, whether you're primary or secondary level, this is where you come in and you make a decision on what are the key concepts you will focus on when you're teaching. And then the opposite to that is there are many different um, ideas that students will already have about uh, states of matter, for example. Um, in this case, a lot of students think that air does not take up a lot of space, right? Or they think uh, atoms or molecules are embedded in matter. So these give you ideas of what students might think about so you can plan activities in advance. So that's the, the AAAS website. And I'll just speak very uh, broadly to concepts. Um, so for example, if you take something like seasons, some people think that we have seasons because uh, the earth is closer to the sun in the summer. That's very common actually, and, and even in adults. Or um, as we were looking at the states of matter, um, a lot of people, students and adults think that molecules in a solid do not move. So those are common misconceptions. So when you're teaching those areas, those concepts, it's good to have that in mind when you're planning for activities. So you can really work on um, moving students' ideas away from their misconceptions towards a scientific understanding of those concepts. Okay, so I'm gonna bring us back to the slides. Okay. So let's, let's do a thought experiment, all right? So you're hopefully seeing an airplane, a picture of an airplane, or maybe one is flying overhead you right now. Um, the concept of lift. What are the key? Of course, lift is very complicated. Just think in your mind right now, or you can even write down in the chat box, what are the key concepts associated with lift? Okay, I'll give you just a few moments just to think in your head. You're thinking if you're teaching at a primary or a secondary level, what are the key concepts you want to focus on? All right, I'm going to just go through a list of possible concepts you might have come up with, or maybe yours are different. Okay, so that is just really getting clear about what, what it is you want to focus on with your students. And you can draw on sources like the AAAS um, to help you identify what these are specifically. The last one is a very um, advanced one. Okay, I'm going to show another resource uh, uh, that will give you um, not only ideas around the concepts, but also some activities you can do to help students um, improve their understanding about concepts and explore um, their, their knowledge through um, hands on activities. So I'm again, I'm going to click to another website. So please bear with me as I do a screen share. All right, trying to find my Zoom. We're having a technical problem here. Okay, I had to stop sharing first and then I'll go to the link, okay. Okay, that was the AAAS. Now this is the this is a website from Deakin University. Again, this is free for you to access, um, and I have it on the page that talks about air and flight. So you can see that there's a list of concepts here, and they're at different levels. So some are at early years, middle years um, are a little bit more advanced, and below is a list of alternative conceptions. Now, if you click on this link. I won't do it because it'll send me off into a weird direction. But if you click on that link, it will give you a list of activities you can do um, that are focused on these specific concepts. So this is another great resource to support um, conceptual understanding um, and um, un understanding what possible um, alternative conceptions students might have. 
Okay, back to the slideshow. Okay, we've talked about concepts. Um, the second thought experiment I want us to do. So we understand concepts, we understand the idea of misconceptions. So how can you explain this? How do you explain the concept of, uh, for example, air having weight? How do you explain that to the students? Or if you want to get the students involved, how can they explain their ideas about lift? Okay. So the answer to the question is using representations. And my colleague, Miss Simone, has already mentioned this. Um, so this is where I'm going to um, elaborate on the idea of representations and why it's important in science. Okay, as you know, we, we've talked about the concept of lift and um, I've provided you with some written um, examples of what these concepts are, but there's so much that goes on um, when you explain the concept of lift. So you need to use more than just writing it or saying it. You need to interact with different modes, we say. So for example, you can draw it um, and you can draw it with annotations. You can use gestures, right? That famous gesture. You can do a role play with a group of students, build models and do simulation, simulations or experiments. So here I wanna shift your thinking Instead of you doing these things, I want you to think about, well, the students can actually do this. Before you even tell them about the official scientific answer to what is lift, just step back a little bit and spend some time to find out what students already think or know about lift. So when they see a plane flying over, and they do that all the time, you can, you can use that as your first prompt to say, well, what's going on? How does that plane stay in the air? Let's have a closer look at that wing. Show me in a gesture what this, what this looks like and explain to me what's going on. So representations are um, many different modes, many different ways you can explain a concept. And each time you say it or write it or draw it or translate between a, um, a written definition and a drawing, you have to make decisions and think about, well, how can I draw this? What do I need to do to draw it? Or if I make a model, what do I need to do to make a model? And when you think in that way, that's actually where the learning happens. So instead of simply um, just copying a definition from the textbook, when students engage in this way, they're much more um, um, interactive with these conceptual ideas, right? Through um, something that's very tangible, something that they can touch. Okay. So let's work through an example. I have a demonstration. So here I go again, sharing my different screen. All right, I found a video on YouTube and I'm just gonna play it in a, a small, small form. Reza, can you give me a thumbs up that you can see the video on, like there's a, a thing? Okay, thank you. All right, I'm just gonna hit play. This is only a few seconds long. Connie, excuse me. Uh, Connie, can you uh, please uh, play again the videos? Oh, sorry. I think some troubles here. Yeah. I didn't. You know what? Yeah. Video, but I didn't hit share. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. now can you see it. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's try that again. Thanks. Thanks for letting me know. Too many buttons to press. Okay. Here we go again. Okay, did you see what was happening? So there was this, this little thing, it's actually a cross section of what would be an airplane wing that if you cut, if you had an airplane wing and, and you cut it in half, it would be that cross section. And then you have a hair dryer coming in, blowing air onto, the, onto that um, wing. So it's flat on the ground at first and then the air comes in and all of a sudden, 
you have what's called lists. So, so that's a demonstration and that's very easy to do at home. And that's something certainly that your, stu your students can do very easily. Okay, but it doesn't stop there. It's not just about doing that demonstration. As, uh, as Ms. Simone has mentioned, it's the discussion around that. So you imagine you do this demonstration uh, with your students and then um, you start asking them questions and you might start off with, draw what's happening, draw a diagram of what is happening here. So they've seen this in, in real life and now you're asking them to represent it in a diagram, a different mode. Um, and perhaps they've come up with something like this, all right? And you didn't tell them anything about colors or arrows, but maybe they came up with something like this. And then as a teacher, you would say, well, what does this diagram show? And you might say, well, you know, it shows that there's air going over the wing and air going under the wing. And, um, you know, the air going over the wing has a longer distance. Um, so it takes longer to go over. Maybe they'll say something like that. Or maybe they'll just say, you know, there's air going through the wing. And then another question is, well, what does this diagram not show? What does it hide? So you think about, well, you know, that demonstration, that video we did, it, it actually shows the motion. So the diagram, it shows the arrows, but the video um, or the real life demonstration actually shows the motion, right? So you get a sense that students are already, when you do that, students start thinking about Oh, okay, this concept is not just a static thing. It's not just a diagram to understand lift. There's actually a lot more going on. And so another question might be, well, what other representations might you use to understand lift? And maybe they'll take a model, create different airplanes, paper airplanes, um, and maybe modify some things with those airplanes, right? So, so you see how these discussions around different kinds of representations really, um, bring out students' understanding of a given concept. Um, and it gives you ideas, that formative assessment as a teacher. What do my students, what do my students know? What don't they know? What can I do next to help them understand? Very powerful. Now, we've probably all seen diagrams that look like this. That's an expert diagram. It's very fancy. Uh, lines and arrows and uh, 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 force of lift moving up, um, lots of big long scientific words. And this is a fantastic diagram, but please don't show it to your students first. Please step back and take some time, get them to look at the plane in the air and, and think about um, how this lift happens. So when you engage students at that level, then you have a chance to understand what do they know and, and what else can I do to help them get closer to a scientific explanation? If you give them the expert diagram at first, it's very overwhelming and you never really understand uh, what they might have already known about flight. And they might just be prompted to memorize that instead of e explore in a meaningful way. So this bottom um, sentence is really important to understand a science scientific concept. Um, it, it is to understand the sum of the representations that describe them. So it is that, you know, that three dimensional demonstration. It is the drawing. It is the gestures. It is the role play. Each time it tells you a little bit more about that concept and students develop a really strong understanding of a concept through these representations. Okay. So applying this to a STEM activity, how can you help on your students understand key concepts around the curriculum topics. So there's just a couple brief pointers now and I'll, I'll um, elaborate more on them as we go. So as a teacher, you need to plan for a variety of activities for, uh, for students using different kinds of represent, representations. And these include discussions, drawing diagrams, creating role plays, doing experiments, or simulations and um, other activities or investigations. Okay, and importantly, there's a way to do this. Again, I, I've said before, don't just give them the expert diagram, spend some time 
to um, understand what their thinking is. And Ms. Simone has already touched on the importance of inquiry. And, uh, and Ms. Simone was very right in saying there's many different ways to do inquiry in science. And I'm going to talk a little bit about inquiry and I'm gonna focus on what's called the five E's. And uh, Ms. Simone touched on that as well. And it is from the United States and it has been um, um, used very well in Australia, particularly with a primary connections program. And I'll walk you through this very quickly because Ms. Simone has already mentioned it. So we start with engage, and that's taking the time to understand what students already know about a concept and explore doing activities with different representations so they can extend their understanding or um, exploring what the different parts of the concept would be. Explaining, which is not just um, the teacher explaining the more scientific explanation, for a concept, but also students starting to, to consolidate their knowledge and, and explain their ideas and, and bringing in those scientific concepts that the teacher is teaching. And elaborate is now that students have a better understanding of a given concept, they're able to apply it to a different situation. These are often design briefs or investigations or experiments. And throughout this process, um, is uh, assessing students' understanding. So at, every time you're discussing their representations, you get an idea of what the students might know and where they need to go. And of course, if you do uh, an activity um, like elaborate, you can make that as a summative task. And that's another way um, that you evaluate their understanding. Okay, I have here, um, students create their own representations to sorry, explain, refine, and share their ideas. And the teacher asks what each representation shows and hide, and this is iterative. So where the five E's, I have it on a list. Um, sometimes you go back and forth and you go around and, are, you know, to revisit things again. And when you do this as a teacher, you, you're very carefully listening to what the students are, are saying and how they're responding to these activities, and then you're adapting. Right? So the most important thing is don't just give them the answer to start off with, spend some time exploring in this space oh. and the five E's with supporting this. Okay, I think we have time. Um, I'm gonna show a video about the five E primary connections. Uh, and this is for the, all the primary teachers out there, but also the secondary teachers, I want you to listen to what these young students are doing, um, learning through the five E's um, and the kind of language they're using um, to, to express their ideas in science. Okay, I'm doing the screen switch again. Go back here. Okay. So this is just a few minutes long. My connections teaching and learning is structured into a five phase model known as the five E's. Engage, or explain, The five E's model is based on theory and research that shows students learn best when they're allowed to work out explanations for themselves from their direct experiences and with the support of their teacher. It begins with a phase designed to create interest and stimulate curiosity. This phase is known as the engage phase. In this initial phase, the teacher asks open questions to draw out what students already know or think they know. Students ask questions, write, draw and act out their understandings. I think this seed isn't alive because it was in a packet and 
Seeds can't grow in packets. Hearing what the students think they know at this early phase helps the teacher take account of students' ideas and adapt following activities to build on their prior knowledge. Next, students explore by engaging in hands-on activities. Students' questions and observations are described in their own words. The explore phase allows students to acquire a common set of experiences that they can use to help each other make sense of the new concept or skill. My one's not really healthy. My one's like, like very, this one's very big. Doesn't look healthy. Doesn't smell healthy. Whoa, mine's got roots. Well, this one's been in a dark box all day and now it smells really bad and I don't like the smell. Only after students have explored the concept through their own hands-on experiences and discussions does the teacher provide the scientific terms used to develop explanations. In the explain phase, opportunity is made for the students to listen to each other's explanations and to the teacher. After discussion, a literacy product is created to represent findings. I've just finished doing our seed germination diary. We made a presentation with PowerPoint. We're doing it on baby seeds, how they grow. In the next phase, elaborate, opportunities are provided for students to apply what they have learned to new situations through planning and conducting an investigation supported with an investigation planner. It's important in this phase to make sure students keep organised records of their observations. This will support students to analyse and reflect on their findings. Explanations are reconstructed and extended through integration with written language, diagrammatic and graphic examples and mathematics. I can show you my diagram here. I've done two. And on this one I had to label it and colour it, but on this one you just draw yours because we did it in groups, so there were three. But this one's just mine. In the final phase, evaluate, students review and reflect on their own learning and new understandings. Students create a new literacy product representing their understanding and providing evidence supporting their new ideas. The 5E's model sort of provides an opportunity for children to um, demonstrate their prior knowledge and to build on that through exploring. The fact that they do a lot of discovery, they make their own discoveries, is very exciting for them. The engage stage is just so exciting. It lures them in, it captures their imagination and they want to learn more about it. They're very engaged and, and don't really realise how much they're learning, literacy particularly through the sciences. And I'm going to stop there just for the sake of time um, and take us back to the slideshow. So even though that, um, that these are, are primary students, they're actually um, engaged in, in a, a, a a very meaningful way in science. And I need to take us back to the PowerPoint. So this, uh, again, there's many different ways to, to do inquiry in science. Uh, we have found this one very um, easy to, to follow and understand and to help scaffold those activities to, to guide students towards these very rich conversations, um, you know, and their understanding of, of any given concept will improve over time through these activities. Okay, so how does this relate to Stellar? Well, you have so many resources now from the, the, all of the Stellar um, um, activities that have been shared. So for example, uh, today we, talked, we started off talking about lift, airplanes and lift. Um, we, we talked about your concepts, uh, your, your ideas on, you know, why do we have lift? How does it work? Um, in the back of my mind, I had a notion of what possible misconceptions I might um, um, anticipate. Um, we did uh, many, well, we didn't do too many representations, but we did a few representations. We did drawings, we did a demonstration. Um, and now you are ready to do an activity um, around wind turbines. So you have enough conceptual knowledge. I'm going to ask you um, with a stellar um, um, resources to determine, well, how do you design the, the most optimal wind turbine? What, what decisions do you have to make about how many blades do you need, the length and the angle? So those concepts of lift will help, um, help with the design of a wind turbine. 
So when you are looking at the stellar resources, I'd like you to think about how you might apply those five E's. So it's very, um, um, it's very common to do the activities first. And sometimes you can start with the activities, but always remember to go back and reflect on what are the concepts and how can we um, do activities um, using different representations and open up the space so students have a chance to explore. So that's all very well and good. You say, well, but what happens when you have a pandemic and how can we do this online? So the next, um, I just wanna have a look at the time. The next um, 10 minutes or so, I'm just gonna take us through some online resources that are free. Um, and some of them are very fancy, but they're free um, if you sign up for a trial or you have access, you know, only limited access. Um, and, um, and some of them that we use right away, for example, like uh, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, and Zoom. So even, even with the resources that we currently have, you can still use these active, um, conceptual focused and representation based approaches. All right, so let's start with engage and explore. So on, on the left uh, hand side of the slide, I have a bunch of links. Again, I will share this with you in a, in a resource, so please don't worry. Um, and on the right hand, I have just some picture examples. So of course we're in Zoom right now, right? And I, um, it's not as easy for me to access um, things like reaction, like thumbs up, or um, you know, clapping, but these are things that you can access in Zoom to see how students are doing. Um, and of course the chat box, I, I know you had a lot more opportunity to chat um, with Simone um, and, and Mr. Greg and Mr. Peter, but these are already available, sorry. Um, and I'm gonna feature, uh, I've, I've outlined, um, there's Kahoot and Quizlet, which are free. I um, mean, you can do multiple choice or true and false, you know, based on concepts and misconceptions um, to get a sense of how students are understanding a given concept. You can also do sticky notes online. Um, and I'll do a demonstration. Um, and before I do that, I'll just highlight, you can also go into Microsoft Word or Google Drawings to get students to make uh, these digital drawings. So these are ways that you can continue to engage and explore students through an online format. Okay, let's check out um, Idea Flip. Sorry, I'm missing all the comments right now, but I'm um, this multitasking is taking all my my brain energy. Okay, so hopefully we're we're online. So can we see the Idea Flip? So again, that's free, um, and I created a board just to demonstrate already. So we'll focus on what causes climate change. So I'm a teacher and I'm asking my students, well, what do you think causes climate change? And the internet is really slow. So it's, it's, it's coming. Be patient. All right, there we go. So they actually take a post-it note and they write down their ideas. Maybe um, it has to do with, um, let's see, what causes climate change? We'll say, um, I think I've already written this down, but farming, um, I think I've written all the good answers. Um, say fossil fuels, I already have that as well. <laughs> okay, but you can see that students can add their ideas and they do this at the same time. Everyone's being able to access this board at the same time. So you get a sense of, oh, what do the students know? And then you can also organize this. So while well, there's a few people that think about fossil fuels, this is related, um, greenhouse gases, maybe that's next to methane. Um, factories are another kind of fossil fuel and so on. But you can see there's a real dynamic um, interaction and it is digital. So just like a just like a whiteboard. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint. 
All right. So these are some um, online ways that you can engage and explore uh, with students. So finding out what they already know and then more interactive activities to do brainstorming, um, mind maps um, and drawings as well. OK, the next slide. Um, is simulations, online simulations on exploring. And again, I have featured two um, FET animations. I don't know if you've heard of PHET, FET animations, and you know the, the good old COVID-19 sim simulator, um, which is a little bit more advanced maybe for secondary students. But let's look at the FET. Okay, so I'm gonna do the screen share again, bear with me. Back to the internet. Okay, so I've already opened up the FET animation uh, just to save a little bit of time. Um, and uh, one of the resources for Stellar is um, energy. So let's explore energy transformation. So in this case, we have somebody riding a bike. We'll say um, this is the mode that the energy is transferred, the energy generator, and we have it powering a light bulb. So through the simulator, you can explore what kind of en energy is created here. Uh, the cyclist needs energy. All right, so we have the system working. Or what if we convert this to sunlight and we have a solar panel, you know, and we're trying to operate a, a, another kind. Actually, we'll do, we'll boil some water. So these animations are, are interesting ways for students to explore different, different concepts. And I'm going to take you back to the actual website. So you can see there are many different kinds of simulations to do, and this is free, it's online. Physics, chemistry, math, earth science, and biology. So for the mathematicians out there, the M in STEM, all kinds of activities students can do at many different levels. So everything very, um, you know, some very basic arithmetic to um, curves, doing sophisticated graphs or making waves. So there's lots of activities and this is students exploring a, a given concept. Okay. So back to the presentation. All right, again, I, I have shared all these links with uh, Reza so you'll have access to them. And um, the final two uh, E's or the final of the five E's are explain and elaborate. And again, you know, as I said, there's, um, there's not always a strict boundary between these two. So sometimes, um, you know, one, uh, one activity and explain can be quite extensive and be a summative task um, or, or can be a very light, ex you know, a, a lighter activity for students to do. And here I'm gonna, um, I'm just gonna point out Powtoon. So that's what Simone did as a demonstration. And you can see um, that is something that the students create themselves to explain something. And in that Powtoon animation that Miss Simone showed, um, the student had to do a lot of planning to prepare that. Um, you know, it does take time. So not only do they have the creative energy of, you know, making this um, animation, but they have to get the science right. Um, so it's quite a rich task. Now, the one I'm going to show you is called a digi animation. So that's digiexplanations.com. And with that, you can make a video like the Powtoon, a digital story, slowmation, podcast, or blended. So I'm just going to do a very uh, quick a demonstration of what that looks like. Okay, so, all right. Now this is, um, this is for the high school teachers, uh, the secondary teachers. This is some, uh, a student explaining a polymerase chain reaction. 
So that has to do with biology and DNA, so P, uh, a PCR. And I'll just show uh, a couple minutes. That was an awful lot of information. How about Science Cat runs us through the process one more time? Science Cat. <laughs> so, first we take a test tube and we add DNA from Pastorella multicida. Then we add the enzyme DNA polymerase, some individual nucleotides known as DNTPs, primers specific to this site of interest, and finally, some water. Once these have all mixed together within our test tube, we place that test tube into the PCR machine. In the PCR machine, the double-stranded DNA from P. multicida is heated to 95 degrees Celsius. This breaks the weak hydrogen bonds that hold the DNA strands together in a helix, creating a nice single strand of DNA for us to use as a template. Once separated into single strands, the DNA mixture is cooled to between 45 to 72 degrees Celsius. This allows the primers to bind to their complementary sequence within the DNA strands. The reaction is then heated to 72 degrees Celsius, the optimal temperature for DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase extends the primers by adding the nucleotides in a sequential manner. These steps are repeated 30 to 40 times to produce multiple copies of the target DNA. Well, there you have it, guys. I hope that answers a few of your questions about polymerase chain reactions. Okay, so I forgot to warn you that the voice is very strange in that. I hope you were able to understand it. All right, back to the slides one more time. Um, so yeah, you can see like when when students actually take the time to make this, it is a it is a big task. That that example of a digi um, a digi animation that would absolutely be a summative task. Um, um, it, you know, it's a very sophisticated uh, undertaking to do that and students have to have a very good understanding to create that but um, what a fun activity to do. And like Simone uh, said, I, I've actually done that with my university students, um, my B ed students that are learning to, to teach in, in the K to 12 setting, but certainly um, as we've seen with that primary connection videos, don't underestimate what the younger students can do with the proper scaffolding, um, not just with the science concepts, but with the technology, they can create um, incredible things. Okay, back to the PowerPoint. We've already done these. And as I said before, the um, um, evaluate happens throughout and that formative assessment, that ongoing um, you know, checks of uh, how students are doing and how they're understanding that happens um, throughout the engage, explore and ex explain phases of the five E's and the summative assessments because um, that's a bit more of a, um, I guess, a, a, a bigger undertaking, a bigger task. Um, some of the explain or the elaborate um, um, activities are more suited for that. Okay, and finally, I think this is the last slide, but I have shared some resources with Reza, as I've mentioned before, so I just want to take you through them, so you know what to expect. And this is the final screen sharing, let's see if I can get it right. Okay, so I think this one. This gives you the, the Word document with all of the links that I've used and, and maybe a few more. Okay, so that's organized by the five E's. Um, and it also other some other STEM resources I talked about, like the AAAS, um, the Deacon Science resources, of course, the five E videos that I've shown, um, as well as um, uh, STEM resources from Monash University um, and Primary Connections STEM. Okay, another resource um, that I have shared is about representation. So this is a one or a two page, well, three pages with the, with the references. It's a primer. It's sort of a basic 101 introduction to using representations as approach to uh, teaching and learning science. Um, and this is based on some of the, the research I did for, for my PhD. Um, and at that time, I was doing my PhD at Deakin University. So that's why I know a lot of those resources at Deakin University. But this will give you um, that, that um, a background on why representations are considered important in science, that it's a language of science, 
um, and then how you can um, do this in your teaching practice. And of course, um, some of the key, the key research that, that supports representations. And the final piece is, um, and, and this is a, a book that both Simone and I have published in, and it has lots of uh, resources uh, in, for teaching secondary science. Of course, it can be adapted for primary science as well. Um, and in here, um, myself and a co-author have developed um, um, information on teaching uh, the five E's using representation. And we've created lessons, uh, an example of a lesson, um, I think in cells. Um, so it, it's, it could be a very interesting resource. Maybe you can access it um, online through your school, um, but that's part of the resource package as well. And I think that's my last screen share. Yeah, and that's that's it for my presentation. Thank you so much for being patient with uh, my navigating these multiple uh, computers and um, for my colleagues for giving me the thumbs up to, to show me that things are working. And I'm really sorry that I've missed all of the chat, but um, I'll hand it back to Reza and um, hopefully he can facilitate us through those great questions coming through. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Connie. It's really a uh, great, inspirative uh, presentation from you. So, yeah, well, uh, thank you very much once again for sharing very interesting ideas on how we use uh, uh, presentation in uh, science learning, especially using the inquiry based uh, science learning. And you also mentioned about the resources, the uh, free resources that is available for teachers to use, like from the AAAS website. Uh, uh, it's about the assessment and finding misconception uh, regarding uh, science concept and from Deakin University as well, from the concepts and activities there, and also several uh, digital tools that uh, we can use uh, in regards to uh, have uh, like a remote or a distant learning in this uh, and then that it's very relevant. So, okay, uh, next, I think we will uh, proceed to the uh, question and answer session. I think we can use about 10, 20 minutes uh, ahead to uh, answer some questions. We have uh, several questions here uh, being raised from participant from YouTube and from the Zoom uh, as well. Uh, but I think for the uh, first one, I would like to invite participants that want to directly uh, ask a question to both our speakers. So are there somebody wants to directly ask? So you may... Uh, Turn on the videos and the mic as well. So let me check here first. Um, okay. Are there somebody? So please raise uh, the uh, raise your hand using the facilities here in the Zoom. Maybe Mr. Or Mrs. Solia. Do you want to ask directly? Okay, I think well, while we're waiting for uh, participants who wants to have opportunity to directly ask, I think we can uh, answer here from the uh, Q&A box. Uh, first from Ms. Sarina Hanifa. So she has a question to uh, Dr. Simone. Thank you for the opportunity. So in the project-based learning, such as creating water filtration, do the teachers need to limit the materials used in the project for the lesson effectiveness, or just let the student to free to explore? the first question and what is the best way 
to summarize the concept if the students uh, uh, investigate some findings in the project well i think that will be the first question to uh, uh, simon and i think if the colleague uh, want to uh, answer i think it's okay okay so please thank you thank you Reza, and, and thank you uh sarina hanifa as well for your question um so with the amount of materials or the different materials uh, this is one that is up to you and it is dependent on the the year level of the students and their experience in conducting fair test investigations so if the students are learning the skills of fair test investigations it can be easier as the as the teacher facilitator to limit the number of materials um, so that all the students are using the same materials however if the students have a lot of experience in doing fair test investigations and you feel comfortable as the teacher to be able to facilitate the use of the different materials um, i think that's a great opportunity for students to get really creative and innovative in coming up with different solutions to be able to solve the the problem or, or resolve their question so that's that's the best way that i can answer that one um, particularly when we're doing remote online learning it, it can be great to open it up and let students use other materials that they might have access to in their homes um, but if they're still learning it'd be important to use the same okay. um, and with the best way to summarize the concept again it will depend which age level you're working with i know connie was talking about um, you know doing these things with primary students as well which i absolutely agree with i think it's very very important um, but the concepts is up to you in which way you want to frame it and i might just share my screen again um razor if that's okay with you yeah you sure yeah you must uh, save screen yep so what you'll be able to be able to see now can you see the adobe the pdf there yep yeah. great so um in the teacher booklet you'll see um this is on page 48 so this is for the um water farming module that we went through there's background scientific scientific information which goes through and outlines all the concepts that you'll need so um, for example if you wanted to look at water quality um, it goes through different aspects or concepts involved with water quality uh, if you wanted to look at water treatment it's same again the concepts here are outlined so um, with the best way to summarize the concept again it will depend on what you want to focus on in that lesson where you're wanting to look at materials it might depend on the year level and and always be guided by the curriculum as well um, but that's there to support you in understanding which concepts mm -hmm. um, can be used in this module. Thank you, Serena. Did you want to add anything, Connie? Yeah, no, I, uh, sorry, Reza. I, I just very quickly, I found that that grid, that variable grid that you do, you know, I've seen that live as well, and it's just such a powerful tool. It seems so simple. Um, mm -hmm. and I that you're able to do that um, you know on on the powerpoint directly so a really effective online resource um, and just you know giving opportunities for the students to play you know before you you know you, you give the definitions just say well what if we just have these two things what what will happen um, yeah i think that's a great tool i'm so glad that you shared it mm. thanks honey okay thank you very much for the response uh, so the next one uh, from I think Miss uh, Solia. So regarding um, Simone's presentation, uh, was attractive for testing water quality by making a filter in order to collect data. She stated that data was collected in dependent and independent variables. So she's curious about the independent and the independent variable. How can we determine? that the dependent variable data and independent variable data. So, so how, how, how to make sure that we uh, use appropriate dependent and dependent variable uh, data? I think that's the uh, question. Yeah. Uh, I guess when you do the variables grid, you want to make sure that you've got 
um, obviously a way to measure the variable organized. And if you're going to change something, you need to make sure you've got enough options to be able to change it. Um, with fair testing, um, I can share a couple of things that I share with my pre-service teacher. If you like, I can share screen again. Yep. Sure. Um, just to talk about it. This is uh, not to do with water, but this is just another example. So we talk about, um, I'll just go back here, fair testing. And I just show them this little YouTube clip. This one's going to work. Hi everyone and welcome back to High School Science 101. Today I am re-recording the first video that I uploaded because it was pretty low quality and I wasn't really happy with it. So this is in high definition. We're covering our three main variables in science, which are our independent, dependent and controlled variables. Let's get started. To explain these variables, there's a very simple experiment I'd like to demonstrate. Firstly, let's say that this is a running track and we have our runner here and he's going to run 100 metres. But each time he runs it, he's going to wear a different type of shoe. So we've got runners, casual shoes and boots. And this is the thing that's going to change each time he runs this 100 metres. And this is called our independent variable. That's the thing that we're going to change each time he runs this experiment. So let's put his runners on first. We start the timer, he runs his 100 meters. We stop the timer and he got a time of 27.3 seconds. And this is the thing that we're measuring. The thing that we're measuring in the experiment is called our dependent variable. It depends on our independent variable. He got a time of 27.3 seconds with his runners. We reset him back to the start. We put his casual shoes on. We start the timer, he runs the 100 metres, and this time he got a time of 30.2 seconds, so a little bit slower this time. We take him back to the start, we put his boots on, we start the timer, he runs the 100 metres, we stop the timer, and this time he got a time of 33.3 seconds, which was his slowest time. So we can say that he runs the fastest with his runners, followed by his casual shoes, and then he runs the slowest in his boots. But that's not everything to this experiment. There's a few other things that we need to consider. The first thing to consider is the weather. We need to make sure that the weather was kept the same each time he ran the 100 meters. If it was sunny when he was wearing his runners, but if it was raining when he wore the other shoes, that's not really a fair comparison because the weather could have had an impact on his ability to run. The clothing that he was wearing is also something that we need to consider. We need to make sure that he was wearing the same clothes every time he ran this 100 meters. If he was wearing running gear, wearing his runners, he had to be wearing running gear for the other ones as well. Otherwise, his clothing could have affected his time. Same with the surface. If he was running on concrete or wood or grass, we need to make sure that that was the same every time he ran this 100 meters so that any difference in time was mainly just due to the shoes that he was wearing. That's what we're trying to achieve an accurate and fair comparison between the types of shoes. Because these are the things that we're trying to control in this experiment, we call them controlled variables. And that's it for today's lesson. I hope you learned something. Please like and subscribe if you want to see more of these videos. Okay, so that's one explanation to show the different types of variables. Um, we also Hi, talk about, I don't know why it does that, but we'll keep going. Um, we also show this, which is quite cute, but the high school students love it too, which is we, when we do an independent variable, we just change one thing. Okay, so we could see in that example, they changed the, the runners, the type of shoe that, that the runner was wearing. We measure something. So in that example, they measured the time. And then everything else was kept the same. So it was the same surface, the same climate, the same clothes that the runner was wearing. And they're called the controlled variables. So the change, measure, and, and control. Um, I hope that answers your question there, um, Sol Solia. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Simone, for the response. And I think that's a, 
funny <laughs> decline there go smooth softly i think that, <laughs> remember so uh, okay i think uh, now we are going to the youtube our youtube uh, questions uh we have here one from uh he is from malaysia so could you share a few tips on how to keep motivating your students to participate during online lesson and doing all the science project at home. Yeah, maybe it's to Dr. Connie and to Ms. Simon. Uh, I'll start off, Simon, if that's all right. So the, the motivation issue was already a challenge before the pandemic. Um, so the pandemic just, you know, um, I think it, amplified everything, um, you know, and I think we're all uh, Zoom fatigued by the end of this year. Um, but saying that, I'll, I'll just back up, even pre-pandemic, the motivation in science, you know, one of the, the, um, the questions when the students ask, why are we learning this? Mm. Why? Like, why, why bother? Um, that's a really important um, a question that they ask and for you as a teacher to make the science meaningful for the students. So Simone, uh, when Miss Simone started her presentation um, today on water quality, um, she immediately started with her own context and then the context um, in Indonesia. And these are real events that affect people and that they would be able to connect to. So that is, um, you know, that's that's the way to engage the students is to is to um, start the science from where they are, you know, what is important to them. Um, everything from floods to um, even um, technical te textiles or um, materials that students will come into contact with, you know, when I'm scuba diving or, you know, when I'm um, doing a certain activity and I'm wearing this protective gear, what, what is special about it? How, how, do, how does that protect me? You know, and using those as a springboard um, um, into the concepts of science. Um, and I will say when you do representations with students, they're doing stuff. Um, they're being very creative and that in and itself is very engaging and motivating. So um, if you could imagine if we think about our own experiences, many of us when we were learning science, you had the, you know, the teacher talking and then the writing on the whiteboard. Um, and we, we all have experienced that. And that's okay sometimes, but if that is your only science experience, I don't blame the students for not being very motivated. So when we move into these hands-on activities, when we use multiple representations, and when we create these meaningful contexts, that helps. Um, you know, it's not a hundred percent solution, um, but that's that's uh, a, a way to get to um, improving students' motivation. Did you want to add? Yeah. 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 I completely agree. It's about relevant and meaningful contexts. And I think when you do give students a problem, which they authentically get to solve, and they don't know the answer, and they have to come up with a way to do it themselves, and we let them be creative and innovative, and really truly explore, I think that's when the real engagement happens. Um, and I'm even though there is a lot of digital work now, and yes, we're staring at screens all the time, as much as you can, get them doing hands-on practical activities in their homes. We, we've got to keep developing our fine motor skills and um, looking at 3D objects and thinking about things that are very practical, um, practically based and situated in the world. So I, I know that we think that you know youtube clips or, or digital is all engaging but there's a lot to be said for the engagement of hands-on practical work as well yeah okay thank you very much uh, for the uh, answers for the questions and we'll see another question here from the youtube i think it's about the larger classroom uh, context so are there any like a uh, strategy that you may uh, uh, maybe have an idea in the larger classroom settings in order to implement this uh, inquiry-based science 
uh, learning and also in this uh, kind of uh, remote learning. So how do you suggest that to have this kind of uh, great atmosphere, uh, learning uh, can going on? Maybe uh, Dr. Connie or Simone? Did you want to go? Con sure. Con yeah. I'll start on that. Um, uh, you know, it's it's the same problem. Like when we are, you have very large um, class sizes, but there are a couple um, online tools I showed you that Kahoot, mm -hmm. Quizlet, mm -hmm. and the Padlet. Any number of students can access that. You know, and some of those they just have to put in a code, um, and then they can um, you get the real time answers. I mean, these are traditional multiple choice or true and false, but that you know those graphs pop up, and you get a sense of you have a hundred students um, from you know various ge geographical areas, and they're all answering this one question. That's very engaging. Um, so those are some of the tools um, you can you can engage a larger audience um, online. Simone, did you want to add? <clears throat> uh, can I just get the question clarified, Reza? When you said yeah. large large classrooms, yeah. what, do you yeah. mean, what did you mean by large classroom? Maybe students, uh, uh, number of students with uh, like thirty to forty in one classroom. So how do we get? them still engage in the in the learning process especially mm -hmm. in this remote learning and distance learning yeah i i feel like i might be repeating myself a little bit here but um it's for me it's the same whether it's a small group or a large group and mm -hmm. um, i've done these activities with with groups of small groups of students and um you know um participants with, with numbers you know 80 to 100 people in a room and at conferences and um, it's it's the same, you know. It's about um, you know the connection with you as the teacher and the student, and you know walking around, engaging, or if it's on the computer, um, and we just get names. I always call upon people's names, and if people haven't got cameras, I engage them in the chat, and it's the same thing. It's connecting with our students and finding out what they're interested in and what they want to learn about and, and where their learning journey is at. So we can we can direct the learning and um, and plan the learning directly for them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, for the response, I think we have maybe uh, just a couple of minutes. So is it it is okay, is it okay for just one more questions? Yeah, sure, Reza. Yeah. Okay, so our last question is that, uh, do you have any advice uh, for teachers who do not have a lot, more, a lot of time to teach science? Uh, I can make yeah. a start if you like, Connie. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's really cool about STEM is that it's integrated and the, the, the program that Connie was talking about before Primary Connections has done a lot of work in advocating for um, combining science and literacy. Mm -hmm. So when you're learning about the core subjects in your schooling, make STEM and science the context for learning in. You don't have to separate everything all out. If you have to do some literacy learning or some numeracy learning, which are the key pillars of education, which we spend a lot of time on, make science the context mm -hmm. and frame everything around that. Um, and then suddenly you, your time opens up and you've got a lot more um, accessibility to being able, able to educate in science and set STEM subjects. Simone, that's great. And um, with STEM, I'll also add the letter A um, is the art aspect. Um, and for all those uh, primary and elementary teachers out there, you are already um, you know, doing uh, incredible work integrating all of the subject areas. You know, by the time we become high school te teachers, we go to science class, we go to math class, we go to English class. You know, these are separate rooms, separate times of the day. But in elementary, you're already in a space of integrating. Um, so for, um, you know, just building on what, what, what um, Simone said, integrating the, the STEM activities for like one very large elaborate, like think of the five E's elaborate task, 
um, and adding art in there as well. And that's, you know, that's also something uh, where representations come in, they bring on that creative and, um, you know, engage students in different ways through, um, you know, 3D models or, or drawings or, or very creative ways to express their ideas. Um, but, you know, again, using um, that, that STEM or that STEAM framework. Um, so you don't have to do things separately. Okay. So, well, thank you very much for the uh, response for this question and association. So, well, due to the limitation of time, uh, actually, we still have many questions, but well, we have to uh, arrive to the end of our discussion session today. So hopefully we can have another sharing session in the near future with uh, both of you, that Connie and Miss uh, Simo. So uh, for the closing, do you have any uh, uh, words, uh, closing words, just to motivate this, all these great uh, uh, teachers, uh, participants, please, that Connie or Miss Simo. I'll start, Simone. I just wanted to say there's so much, um, so many resources online. Um, and uh, one thing we learned in the pandemic is that, um, you know, parents aren't very good teachers overall. Teachers have that special something and they have a really important role. And part of that role is, you know, being able to understand, um, you know, all these resources online and how, how to make a cohesive lesson and to make it meaningful for students. Um, so I will say what you do is so important. Um, it's not easy to do, um, especially in the pandemic, but it can be very powerful um, in terms of influencing the students um, in ways that I think in Australia, I know the parents and the public are just, you know, they've, they've really, um, um, you know, began to understand how important is the work of the teacher and what a sophisticated undertaking it is. So um, thank you so much for taking the time to, to um, join our webinar, you know, and to take on these ideas and ask for the resources and ask for the questions. Um, it's your learning journey and you have a really important contribution to make um, in, in that. So, so thank you. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Connie. So, Ms. Simon, uh, for closing uh, statements, words for our uh, participants today. Yeah, absolutely, Reza. Um, I would like to thank you all for taking the time out to be here and to allow us to collaborate as you know, a worldwide community of educators. And I know we have people on from across across the globe and yeah. also from across different sectors in, in primary and secondary and tertiary. And it's such a wonderful thing to be able to come together in these spaces. So um, I'm a lot of um, deep appreciation to Simeo QTEP for, for hosting this to enable us to be able to come together and learn together. I think what everyone's been putting in the chat so far about it's a great sharing is very true because um, I've equally learned a lot um, from your questions and from your contributions as well to understand more about some of the challenges that are being presented in your countries. And I love that we can learn together in this way. So um, thank you for supporting these, these um, webinars from CMEO QTEP. I think the more we support them, then, then the more um, they're enabled to happen. In, into the future as well. Um, and hopefully I very much look, coming, look forward to coming back and visiting your country in, yeah. in person. Yeah. It would be wonderful to see, to see you again. And yeah. if, if you'd like me to share the PowerPoint, Reza, that's, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. We'd yeah. that can be given to the participants. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much once again for both of you, uh, Connie and Simone, for yeah, taking the time to join this a webinar to share your ideas, your expertise in this uh, uh, science learning. And thank you uh, also for sharing your wonderful, inspirative uh, presentation. And yeah, hopefully we can meet uh, each other again face to face here in <laughs> Bandung. Uh, yeah, hopefully uh, next year if the situation has uh, going well. So. Mm. Yeah, hope that you and yeah your family there is uh, 
safe and healthy condition. Thank you very much once again. To Thank, Dr. You. Thank you. Thank you. And to you too, Reza, and to your young family. Yeah. And good to see you, Dr. Connie. <laughs> okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, participants, um, before we end this webinar, I would like to remind you to fill the attendance form. Uh, we have that we have shared the link to access the attendance form on the chat box, and also regarding the e certificate, please fill the the attendance form as it is one of the requirements for you to get the part uh, the certificate. And for participants who join us too. Uh, you can also submit this webinar, webinar resume through the link on the screen to get a certificate and we will send the certificate to your email by seven working days at latest and also please fill in the evaluation form at the link that we share on zoom and youtube chat box for our evaluation to improve our future program and finally on behalf of Simulacatomy Science, I'd like to extend our gratitude to Dr. Connie, Ms. Simone, and also to uh, XC Australia for uh, sharing and support to this uh, webinar. And last but not least, thank you for all participants for joining this webinar. So stay safe and see you in our next webinar. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Have a great uh, day. Thank you very much. Once again, the Kani, Ms. Simone. Thank you. And thank you, Reza, for being such an expert facilitator. Amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you in 2021. We hope. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.
Okay. Bye bye, Doctor Honey Small. See you again next time.